Since the fall of man, a war has raged between good and evil. Over the centuries, this war has distorted the truth. Now the truth is perceived as lies, and lies acknowledged as truth. To this day, the battle continues as we investigate and debate the truth behind the history and mystery of the universe. We are Paratruth Radio. Hey, para fans! Welcome to Paratruth Radio. My name is Justin, and I'm Eric. And tonight we are going to be talking about the chupacabra with special guest Ben Radford with his book Tracking the Chupacabra. The chupacabra is a purported creature said to exist in parts of Mexico and Puerto Rico. Some even claim that the creature is either the same or related to the Jersey Devil. Chupacabra means goat sucker in Spanish, and it was given the name due to the victimized goats that it would leave behind drained of their blood. Now Paratruth presents Chupacabra, the vampiric beast, with special guest, Ben Radford. All right, folks, as I promised about a couple of months ago, for those of you who've been tuning in every week, you know that I am currently in pre-production for a brand new movie called The Revealed. It's a movie that I wrote that I'm directing and that I'm producing. And as I had mentioned a couple of months ago, I would keep everybody updated as those updates came in. And today we have a brand new update. Today, I, well, not literally today, but a couple of days ago, I uh, got the okay permission to go ahead and start filming this fall. And I got specific dates. And those dates are September 22nd to October 1st. So I just wanted to give everyone a heads up, let you know that this film is a go. It is greenlit. We are getting ready. I'm going to be asking for your help soon. So stay tuned. And yeah, I think this is going to be a great thing. and I'm really excited. So just wanted to update everybody. We also have some exciting news. Paratruth Radio will be at Scarefest this year. And Boom. We will not have a booth or anything, but we will be walking around with Paratruth t-shirts on. You guys will recognize us. Uh, you've seen the pictures as well as heard our voices, so you should recognize us at least. Mm-hmm. Um, so we'll be we will be there walking around, you know, doing the usual scene thing as well as just making our our voices known in the uh, paranormal community as well. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Also, regarding Scarefest, we're telling you we're going to be wearing our Paratruth shirts. Some of you know our current design for Paratruth, the PT with the blue and uh, orange coloring in the background. I want to give everyone a heads up that we are currently in the works of producing a new logo for our show. Our new shirts will be sporting the brand new logo, which will be in effect within about a month, probably. So just want to give everyone a heads up on that. Also, another heads up. We have a lot of heads up and updates today, don't we? (laughs) Just we really do. This is going to be a update episode for sure. (laughs) Well, another update. The third one, I think, or the fourth one. I don't even. I've already lost count. We are working on a brand new series for the radio show here. Uh, It's still going to be Paratruth Radio, but we are going to be adding another episode, an extra episode per month to kick off a brand new series. And I'm not going to give too much information away right now. I just want to give everyone the heads up to look forward to it because it is going to be a little bit different. It's a little something where, uh, let, let's just say that Justin and I time travel. So look forward to that. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> time travel to the very distant paranormal past. Indeed. Very. Yes. Yes. <laughs> All right, folks, let's welcome in Benjamin Radford. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Ben, welcome to Paratruth Radio. How are you tonight? I'm doing good. Doing good. It's uh, I'm in New Mexico. It's a it's a it's a might uh, might warm here, but uh, not too bad. Good. Good. Yeah. So uh, for our listeners who have not heard of you or heard of the book, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, where they can find you, all that good stuff. 
right, sure. Um, my name is Benjamin Radford. I'm the uh, deputy editor of Skeptical Inquirer Science Magazine, uh, which is published by the nonprofit educational organization, the Center for Inquiry, uh, in Buffalo, New York. And uh, I've written uh, seven or eight books, depending on how you count them. Um, I have a master's degree in education. I have a bachelor's in, uh, in psychology. Uh, I'm a writer for Discovery News and occasionally LiveScience.com. Uh, I do a bunch of weird uh, investigation y stuff. Um, uh, I'm a member of the American Folklore Society, and I love to uh, come across mysteries and just sort of sink my teeth into them and, and not let go until I've, uh, I've satisfied myself that I probably found the answer. All right. So, going through the book uh, a little bit, you start out the book with saying that. There's so many different accounts of the Chupacabra. Um, why don't you tell our, our listeners a little bit what, what you came across? Yeah, well, I mean, it was the, the Chupacabra was. I'll just start out by, by the beginning. I mean, the, you know, the main reason that I wanted to write the book. There's actually two reasons. One is that I had previously done work in cryptozoology, so I'd done stuff on lake monsters. I co-authored a book uh, with Joe Nickel called Lake Monster Mysteries, uh, and I've written a lot about Bigfoot and, and you know other other uh, cryptos and and, zoo, and uh, cryptozoological creatures like that. But I hadn't really done anything on the chupacabra, and I was I was interested in it because, for well, the two reasons: one, uh, the chupacabra it's a vampire, and that's cool. <laughs> it's like you know, <laughs> it sucks blood in you know, in, in the in the pantheon of these mysterious animals, there's very few ones that, that suck blood. I mean, Bigfoot isn't a vampire. The Loch Ness monster is not a vampire. Mothman is not a vampire, and so you know, almost all of the 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 main marquee cryptozoological mysteries you can think of aren't vampires, but this one is. And, of course, if it's a vampire, then that means it sucks blood and has victims, and it leaves, presumably leaves bloodless carcasses, you know, in its wake, which is, like, so creepy and cool. I was like, how can I not investigate this, right? <laughs> so part of it was it being a vampire, and the other part was that uh, there were actually sightings and reports here in my home state. In fact, uh, there were two chupacabras that were sighted and or found um, in, in different cases uh, within about probably five miles from where I am now. Uh, so there was a strong connection to my home state, and also... Uh, I speak Spanish, and so it was easier for me to to travel in Latin America and to do oh, research okay. and trying to do all that. So that was those are the things that really intrigued me and, and sort of led to my spending uh, about five years research, researching this mystery. Wow. So the different accounts that, that you put in the book, and I've read too, there's several different ones, but one of them is almost a dog-like creature with profound fangs uh, for presumably drinking blood, uh, completely hairless. Uh, sometimes it has wings, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes right. it looks like <laughs> an alien-type creature with spines on the back of it. Through all the, dif- the different accounts, did you ever come across one where you could actually say definitively that it, that's what it looks like? Um, not really. I mean, that was one of the that was the most interesting parts about this mystery was that there was this wide variety. I mean, there was all these different things being lumped together in terms of under the under the sort of generic name Chupacabra, mm-hmm. um, and that was what that was one of the things that, that was the sort of difficult to untangle at first because I'm thinking, well, hold on here, you've got photos of these these essentially look, hairless looking dogs or coyotes, and some people are calling this a Chupacabra, but on the other hand, if you go back to the original reports, uh, they're describing this bipedal, spiky-backed, alien-looking creature, and that's also the chupacabra. And on top of that, you've also got this sort of grab bag of, of, uh, of you know, weird-looking, basically any sort of um, unknown animal or, or animal that can't be immediately identified is also becomes a chupacabra. And so... That was one of the keys to solving the mystery was 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 delumping it and separating out and say, okay, where where did all these come from? Mm-hmm. Uh, and 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 it was actually really interesting if you look at it. Uh, there in, in my book, I essentially identify three types of chupacabras. There's the original chupacabra, which was cited in 1995 by a woman named Madeline Tolentino, and she was she was sort of like the case zero. She was the very first person to ever see what was what later became the chupacabra. 
and she reported this creature that was between three and five feet tall. It had long fingers and and uh, and, and toes. Uh, it had no tail. It had sort of alien wraparound eyes, um, and uh, uh, had like almost no nostril, no ears, uh, big eyes, uh, sort of a slit mouth. But its most prominent feature were, were these giant spikes uh, on its back, and this was the very very first case uh, that I came across in my research of the, the, that, uh, that anybody ever called the chupacabra. And that mm-hmm. that was the original chupacabra, again, that, that circulated from about 1995 until about uh, 1999 or 2000. And what happened at that point was suddenly the chupacabra changes form. Suddenly people aren't reporting seeing these this weird alien spiky backed creature. Suddenly the chupacabra uh, the, the people are, are talking about are essentially canids. There are dogs, coyotes, foxes, things like that that have no hair. And so you go from this creature that is unlike any known animal to all of a sudden um, you have these, these sort of hairless dogs and coyotes. And that was a big transition. And what happened was that if you take the original chupacabra, is no one ever saw the bodies. It was always, it was just, you know, people, eyewitness reports and people, you know, saying, I heard something, I saw something, it was weird, but there was never any hard physical evidence. Mm-hmm. And that changed around 2000, when all of a sudden, when you switch to a different type of chupacabra, you switching to the dogs and coyotes, and the, you know it looks like a hairless dog. At this point, the situation reverses. At this point, you have very, very few sightings of anything of any sort of weird, mysterious animal doing anything unusual. But you do have the exact opposite. You suddenly have carcasses. You have you have you know actual bodies um, that you can you can do DNA tests on. And that was one of the keys to solving the mystery. Was that all of a sudden, starting around 2000, you had these these dead canids and if you have a body you then then you know you can do dna tests and you can there's other ways of, t- of determining is this actually chupacabra or not and so that was one of the big turning points and then the third type of chupacabra that i talk about in the book is sort of a, a catch-all um, is sort of you know what's happened over the last 20 years is that the word chupacabra has come to mean anything weird you know, any weird ass thing, someone washes up on a beach or, you know, somebody trips over in Texas or whatever else. If someone can't figure out what it is instantly, it's a chupacabra. <laughs> uh, and I see this over and over and over again. So, so again, there's the original sort of alien-esque spiky back creature. Uh, and then there's the, 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 the canid, the sort of, you know, hairless dog coyote type thing. And then there's a sort of grab bag of, of things that ever, everything from a raccoon to a dried fish, <laughs> a dried skate, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there, there's, a, there's a variety of stuff that all sort of works into the mystery. So, all right, so this change between the first one and the second one around 99 or, or 2000, why do you think that change came all of a sudden? Is it because, you know, they, they started finding these bodies and they couldn't exactly identify them through DNA testing or whatever? Or is it because you think people just wanted answers to something, to a question that they didn't have answers to originally and they decided, oh, well, let's just choose this and make this our chupacabra? Well, that, that's actually a great question, and uh, I mean, the, the, the fact is that you know the the you know this whole the whole chupacabra phenomena it wasn't consciously driven. It's not like someone said, "I'm going to label it this," "I'm going to do that." Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it, it was very much a, a sort of a fluid sociological and cultural phenomena. And so, what what I think happened was that. That uh, again, you had this the, the 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 type one chupacabra that emerged in August of ninety five, and the people who wanted to believe that it was real, that there really was this bizarre, unknown, monstrous, blood sucking thing, they they needed evidence. They needed something more than just somebody repeating what Madeline Tolentino had seen, or you know, I saw something dark and weird out of the corner of my eye, things like that. Mm-hmm. I think so. So in order for the belief in the chupacabra to continue. Uh, again, about five years after the first sighting, I think that people had to start um, – they had to sort of start looking for hard evidence just to sustain the belief because otherwise it was like, well, there's this one thing. It was seen a half dozen times in Puerto Rico and basically not since then. And so what happened was that in, in August 2000, there was a, there was a farmer, uh, a rancher in, named uh, Jorge Talavera in Nicaragua. And he, um, I have a section in the book talking about the case, and it was it was essentially the first 
body of a chupacabra that was supposedly found, and it was a skeleton. And uh, he saw this. The, he, the the story is basically that he claimed that uh, something was attacking his his animals on his on his ranch in in uh, in uh, northern uh, Nicaragua, and uh, he didn't know what it was. He he and a ranch hand uh, staked out late at night, waiting for whatever whatever mysterious vampiric creature was going to show up, and he shot at it. And uh, he he says he hit it, uh, but it ran away. And a couple of days later, his his farmhand saw this the skeleton um, a couple of miles away, and they assumed, maybe rightly, maybe wrongly, but they assumed that the creature that they had shot uh, the, a couple of nights before that was attacking their animals was whatever this this now skeleton was that had been reduced to skeleton because of the predators. So they saw this and they said chupacabra. That was that's sort of the first thing that pops in their mind. So they took it to uh, to the university and they had it analyzed, and uh, the university said, "Well, this is all very interesting, and it's a dog." <laughs> and they're like, they're so they, then the story really got interesting because they then they claimed um, uh, Talavera claimed that there was a cover up. He said. He said, "No, I, I didn't bring you the skeleton of a dog. I said I gave you some unknown, mysterious thing." And the university's like, "No, dude, you I, I'm sorry to burst your bubble. The skeleton you gave us was of a dog. We're not part of cons- some conspiracy. We're not hiding anything. You gave us a dog." <laughs> uh, and so it turned into this whole big he said, she said thing. Uh, and eventually, uh, Talavera sort of grudgingly admitted, as I recall, that he had in fact <laughs> he had in fact given them a dog skeleton. But that was the that was the. First First um, sort of type two uh, canid uh, type chupacabra that emerged in, in 2000, and from there it, it, it they, they become much more common. So you see one in in uh, 2006, 2007, 2009, 2004 that are all um, these these you know hairless canids. Hmm. Now the one thing that you mentioned in the book too is that this creature, since there's so many different manifestations of it and because it's kind of a catch-all that maybe this thing is more of a chameleon type creature why don't you elaborate on that a little bit yeah i mean that's this is one of the 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 difficulties was you you had people who i mean basically what happens is if you if you look in sort of superficial accounts of the chupacabra if you just look on wikipedia or if you look actually the wikipedia page is pretty good because they they cite me at my research in my book so i'm not going to bash the wikipedia page but, <laughs> but if you but you know there's lots of websites that are sort of mystery mongering blah 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 and and you know but the point is that if you if you look at some of the more superficial treatments of the chupacabra in books and magazines whatever else they suggest that 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 uh, that these are that all the chupacabra sightings are essentially uniform. They say, oh well, you know, this is this is what this is. You know, it's it's this tall and has this thing. But the fact, excuse me, the fact is, if you actually go back and you look at the original. The original accounts. There's a wide variety. The, these people are not all reporting the same things. They're simply not. Uh, if you actually go back and you do the, the research and you know go back to the original sources, you find that that uh, you know some people were reporting that it had wings. Some people were saying it didn't have wings. Some people were saying it had a, a long tail. Some people said it didn't have a tail at all. <laughs> I mean, it's like <laughs> it's all over the map here. And so you know, so the, the the simple fact is that once you once you compile all these reports, and I did for my book. I mean, I. At one point, I was sitting there at, at, at my kitchen table, looking at dozens and dozens of descriptions, trying to make sense of it all. And once you once you actually see the, the raw data, you realize that not all these people you know, can be accurate. I mean, they just they just can't be. They can't. The chupacabra can't both have wings and not have wings. Right. Right. The chupacabra can't have you know two legs and also four legs. I mean, so somebody around here. Is, is wrong, and 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 I would argue uh, that many of them are wrong. In fact, most of them are wrong, and it's not a matter of anybody lying or hoaxing. I mean, there were, you know, in my research with with uh, with you know Bigfoot and lake monsters and other uh, you know cryptozoological mysteries, you know, I have of course encountered hoaxing. I've encountered people who fake stuff and you know they're they're liars and they're pranksters. But mm-hmm. for the most part, in my experience, the people that I interview are sincere. They 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 really did see something weird and. And uh, again, I, I go back to my, as I mentioned, I have a degree in psychology, and I can tell you that the eyewitness perceptions are notoriously bad. You have people who 
can see the exactly the same thing and they'll give you very different accounts. And it's not that anybody is stupid or crazy or lying. It's just that's how human perception works. We don't we don't our minds and eyes don't operate like video cameras. Uh, right. We misremember right. things. We, we, we misperceive things. And so once you understand that, then the fact that, that, that all these descriptions of the Chupacabra are so varied across time and geography uh, makes more sense. And so you, th- at that point, then you have to sort of pick out the themes. And you say, all right, well, what are most people reporting? And when you do that, then you can, also, you can often trace it almost like a folkloric uh, point of view and tr- trace it back to some original sightings. In particular, the, uh, the Madeline Tolentino, the original sighting, was very, very influential because, uh, it, again, that happened in August of 95. And many of the reports that happened in the weeks and months afterwards were very, very similar to Tolentino's. They weren't exactly the same, but they were similar. And so you can sort of say, okay, well, it's, it's very likely that they were influenced by that. All right, folks, I think we're going to take our first break. You are going to hear Eric's random fact of the day, and we will be right back with Paratruth Radio. Now, Eric's random fact of the day. Let's face it. Some people are just plain weird. According to CNN.com, in March of 1996, a man demanding to hear a Muppet song, The Rainbow Connection, by Kermit the Frog, burst into a radio station in New Zealand and took the manager hostage. According to the New Zealand Press Association, the 21-year-old man, who was not identified, also demanded that he be allowed to talk to listeners on the air of Star FM or he threatened to detonate a bomb. But before Kermit croaked out his first note, police stormed the station and arrested the man. No one was injured, and the bomb was found to be fake. And so the man was charged with kidnapping. This was Eric's All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name's Justin. And I'm Eric. And we've been talking to Ben Radford about his book, Tracking the Chupacabra. Uh, we just got done talking about how the this thing kind of has somewhat of a chameleon type thing because people are always coming up with a different description. As Ben said, there's sometimes a tail, sometimes not, sometimes wings, sometimes not, sometimes it's a dog type creature, sometimes it's an alien type creature. So... A lot of times, uh, me and Eric are always coming to, you know, the mind perceive, uh, perceives things that just scare you because you don't know what you saw. As you were saying, as a psychology or psychiatry uh, major, so that fear factor takes hold. Do you think mm-hmm. that's why there's this chameleon effect? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One of them is that uh, is that you know when you when you I mean when you have a mysterious creature that is inherently unknown. I mean, no one knows for certain what the chupacabra is. I, I put forth a pretty good explanation in, in my book, but in terms of an actual physical creature, it's the same thing with Bigfoot. We, we, we don't have a Bigfoot, you know, in a cage or in a museum that we can say, this is definitely Bigfoot, or this is definitely Loch Ness Monster over else. And so, because of that, uh, what you have is you have different people's interpretations and recollections and perceptions and and and, I, and eyewitness accounts of what they interpret as a Bigfoot or a lake monster, whatever else. And in this case, it's, it's what, what they interpret as chupacabra. And uh, the chupacabra is 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 unique uh, in that it's one, I would argue, uh, that it's, it's, uh, it's very much a product of the Internet age. Um, you know, the, the other creatures, uh, actually maybe Slender Man would be a, a I was going to say it's, Slender it's, Man was mm-hmm. a movie yeah, not, that somebody made and then it became yeah, a huge well, thing. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, Slender Man. I mean, it, that's sort of different than a monstery, you know, Bigfooty type. Chup- but but essentially, other than you know, Slender Man might be a second one. But in terms of like the the, the classic monsters uh, that some people believe exist, 
the chupacabra was 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 one of the first because uh, again it was it was it came into the fore it came into the public's consciousness right around ninety five when the internet was just going uh, going and, and and spreading and so uh, you had people who were actively promoting the story of the chupacabra and many of them actually were UFO buffs um, in fact that's one reason why the chupacabra folklore and the stories behind the chupacabra are very much intertwined with with uh, UFOs and aliens uh, there's a couple reasons. One of them I, I can go into in terms of the origin of the, the first sighting. But another reason is that the, the first people to to uh, to promote um, Manolet and Tolentino's sighting were, were UFO buffs uh, in Puerto Rico. And so they put their own sort of alien UFO type spin on it. And this this got it, this you know put it out on online, then it went to TV and and you know and, and elsewhere. But so the, the what I'm getting at is that because there's there's basically this this label floating around of chupacabra, uh, and you know if you think anything unusual in the Latin America or Spanish speaking world, it's a chupacabra, <laughs> no matter what, no matter what the hell it is. It doesn't matter if it's 50 feet tall, has eyes. It doesn't matter. The the default assumption is. Is weird Hispanic animal type thing. It's it's automatic chupacabra, and because of that, that is one of the reasons why you have such a, a, a an umbrella label. That's why that's why the chupacabra is is uh, is sort of uh, is is you know all these other sightings that are very disparate and very different are sort of lumped together under the chupacabra. And so part of it is that that some of them some of the sightings are being influenced by previous reports, but part of it is just that. That you know, they, this word chupacabra floats around on news media and TVs, the internet, on TV reports, the internet, and their assumption is that's what it is. And so you have all these different people who, if there was another word for for another weird Spanish-speaking animal that no one knew of, they would also use that word. But as it is, there's really only one word, and that's chupacabra, which means that there you've got these dozens and dozens of of different reports that are being lumped together uh, as this creature. <laughs> Now, when we were on break, you and I were talking a little bit, and you asked just how deep we can get on this show in regards to this conversation. And I know the one thing for Pear Truth Radio is we'd like to take topics as deep as possible, because not many people go very deep when they go into their own research. In fact, most of them just hit Wikipedia, and that's about it. But the one thing you had mentioned was that you have... You've done research on a bunch of different theories and views as to what the chupacabra is or where it came from. And the one that you mentioned that really grabbed my attention was this creationist view of what the chupacabra is. Can you elaborate on that a little bit for us? Yeah, that was that was one of the real surprises <laughs> when I was when I was researching this. I mean, I, I was expecting the UFO angle. I was expecting the conspiracy angle. I was expecting the sort of Frankenstein monster angle. The you know the genetics. I can talk about that later. But I wasn't really expecting the the, the Jesus angle. <laughs> that was that was not on my radar when I was researching the Chupacabra. But sure enough, right? So um, so I was I was looking at this stuff and uh, I. Found Found that there was a guy named uh, James Lloyd who had something called the the Christian Media Network. Um, far as I know, it's it's a post office box somewhere, but it's it sounds very very officious. And this guy wrote a book, a pamphlet called Chupacabras: The Devil's Genetics. And I talk about it in my book. And he, this guy uh, James Lloyd, he makes the argument. Uh, it seems to be sincere. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't see any smiley faces or satirical angle on it. He seems to believe that the chupacabra is the result of of genetics uh, experiments. But he also believes that the chupacabra was uh, actually foretold in the Bible. Uh, he, he talks about uh, there's hideous monsters mentioned in, in Re- Revelations 9. Mm-hmm. And he says, look, you know, the, the chupacabra, it's this weird, you know, thing that's, um, uh, you know, this weird creature. And it's uh, it's 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 the the, the devil's, uh, you know, it's the devil's uh, work upon us. And at first I thought, well, this is just some crank. I mean, you know, not that he's not some crank, but I'm like, this is this can't be. But sure enough, I did more research. And there's been at least two other Pentecostal preachers that I read about who also claimed in the late 90s and early 2000s that the Chupacabra was 
uh, was God's punishment. It was it was visited upon us as an evil vampiric entity to you know, to to uh, get us back on the path of righteousness. And of course, this is an old old so old story. I mean, during the plagues during the Middle Ages, right? There were uh, the penitentes who would, who would whip themselves bloody because they believed that the 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 plague and the, all the death and disease wasn't, of course, bacteria or or, or uh, viruses, which we know it was now, mm-hmm. but it was God's wrath, and because they didn't. They didn't have germ theory, and so the assumption was they had done something bad to bring this upon us. And this is this is you see if you if you look deep enough in the Chupacabra lore, you see exactly this sort of theme. Uh, so that that came up, and then but the, the other bizarre little uh, Christian angle was that one of the Chupacabras. There's about a half dozen Chupacabras, sort of like a half dozen main chupacabras that are that are well known that I talk about in the book okay. and one of them uh, was found in, in Blanco, Texas uh, and it was given to a taxidermist named Jerry Ayer uh, who I've talked to and he's an interesting guy and he actually is one of the few people who's mounted and taxidermied and led to chupacabra and that chupacabra uh, was later sold to a creationist museum huh. uh, a guy named John Adolfi uh, who runs a creationist museum? I've forgotten where it is. Probably Tennessee or Virginia area. He he wanted to buy the chupacabra as proof that scientists can be wrong. Basically, their their premise is: look, okay, yeah, okay, fossils, evolution. You know, all the scientists are saying this, but you know, scientists can be wrong because you know, ju- don't believe that evolution, that, that crazy theory of evolution stuff. <laughs> you know, Earth is only four thousand years old, and and his way of proving that was to display a chupacabra as if the scientific community had come together in some consensus said, this is absolutely impossible. There's no way this could exist. And he's like, well, here it is. <laughs> well, <laughs> I think he probably had some egg on his face when they did DNA testing and they, they determined it was almost certainly a dog. So it's probably the most expensive dog ever <laughs> exhibited in a creation museum. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the thing too, like, there's so many different angles that this thing could come from. And one of them that caught my eye, and I've read this numerous times, of it being a government experiment that escaped. In a way, I could see how people would come to that conclusion. But what did you come across in your research to even point in that direction? You have to look at why did people believe this? You know, where where did this come from? And the, the fact is that these sorts of beliefs that they don't appear out of nowhere. There, there's reasons why these these beliefs and these stories circulate. Uh, the problem for believers in the chupacabra uh, was well, there's many different problems, including a lack of evidence and right. so on. But but <laughs> among the problems with the chupacabra is that you have to explain where did it come from. Mm-hmm. Because the chupacabra, to the best of my research, was first cited and reported in 1995. Now, there's uh, I've had people who've contacted me saying, "No, you know, I heard about it back in the 70s and the 80s in Texas and, and elsewhere." And my answer is always the same, which is, "That's interesting. Show me some proof. Show me some evidence." In fact, I've even offered a $500 reward for anybody who can find a, a printed, published reference to a chupacabra. It has to be a vampiric chupacabra, not just... I mean, because there's also, there's also a whippoorwill bird. Uh, so, you know, a chupacabra means goat sucker in Spanish. So I'm referring specifically to a mysterious vampiric animal known anywhere in the world as a chupacabra before 1995. And I've, offer, I've had that offer uh, for, for years now. No, one has, you know, no one's yet uh, taken me up on it. So I'm pretty confident. I could be wrong. If, if, someone has, you know, if someone has better information, send it to me. I'd be happy to see it. But the fact is that, that you know, essentially the chupacabra was, was never heard of or spoken about or even thought of before 1995. And so this is a problem if you believe in it because – you know, uh, Bigfoot, for example, was was discussed as early as the 1950s, 1960s. Mm-hmm. Uh, Loch Ness monster goes back to the the 30s and, and elsewhere. So, but the, the chupacabra, it, assuming it's a real creature, it it couldn't just appear out of nowhere. I mean, real animals don't suddenly like. It's like I mean, you don't hear well. The giraffe appeared in Philadelphia in 1932. <laughs> Like that's not how right. that works. Right. This, yeah. this is not this is not plausible. And so so the problem for believers in the chupacabra was okay. How do we explain the fact that there was no pro, there's no provenance for this? There's no history to it. Right. And their answer, the one they came up with, 
was there were actually two explanations, and they were combined. One of them was that it, that the chupacabra was the result of aliens, that uh, that extraterrestrials in, in flying saucers had come down uh, to Puerto Rico and were you know probing hillbillies, you know, <laughs> Harvey, wh- whatever it is they do. And while they were there, this this chupacabra escaped. From from the flying saucer, basically the idea is that the chupacabra sort of like they're the alien's pet that okay. somehow escaped and they couldn't get it back. You know, they called for it and you know it didn't have its <laughs> collar on, so it got away. <laughs> so that's the first explanation. The second explanation is the chupacabra is the results of top secret U.S. government genetic experiments gone wrong. And this is basically a version of the Frankenstein uh, mythos. It's, you know, the idea that you know people were playing God somewhere, and you know they they shouldn't have been doing this, and they're messing with genetics, and you know the, it's the sort of Monsanto <laughs> uh, right. type type thing. And so that was the explanation was that uh, was that, and actually, the, the, if you go to Puerto Rico, there's a place. Uh, near uh, near the capital um, uh, called the El Yunque Rainforest, and uh, it's uh, that is uh, according to many people the, the the home of the chupacabra. The chupacabra uh, was first sighted, they claim, in El Yunque Rainforest, which is a it's a you know it's a, it's a densely populated rainforest. Uh, it, you know it's, it's a dense rainforest, um, and the claim is that there's a top secret um, you know U.S. Uh, genetics you know lab that uh that there was a hurricane and a hurricane came through and it you know destroyed homes and destroyed this and that but among its casualties was this top secret research facility in the LUNK rainforest it basically car ripped a hole in it or something and the chupacabra escaped so those are the two main theories uh that the that, that circulated about the chupacabra's origin so one of the uh things that uh, has come up in theater and, and movies a, a lot about scientific experimentation is combining human DNA with alien DNA, and um, that that kind of goes along the lines of the one sighting, the first sighting being an alien type creature, uh, being maybe a scientific experiment. Um, why don't you elaborate a little bit more as far as why it would look like an alien? Sure. I mean, that was, you know, basically what had happened was that, like I said, I spent about five years, five years researching this. And so I, I went to the jungles of Nicaragua. I spent a week looking for chupacabras there. I tried tracking it there. I interviewed witnesses. I went out to Cuero, Texas for the TV show Monster Quest, uh, interviewed stuff there. So, I mean, I, I basically did everything I could do to try and track down and piece together all the different parts of this mystery. But the, the one thing that I, that I, that was very, that was illegal. The one thing that I, I couldn't quite nail down towards the end of my research was, okay, the, all this is well and good. I mean, I had already done, I'd already looked at the reports saying that these, these, uh, these, these, um, these essentially hairless canids, uh, when you do DNA testing on them, they turn out to be dogs and coyotes. Uh, the genetics is, is pretty clear. Um, I mean, it's the, <laughs> DNA don't lie. It's, it's right there. That's what they are. <laughs> so, you know, uh, so, the, so once you sort of realize, okay, well, this is not a chupacabra, this is not a chupacabra, this is no animal, etc., all that's well and good, and, you know, it can get into, you know, the illusion of vampirism and all that. But the, the, the big question that remained towards the end of my research was, okay, that's all well and good. The chupacabra probably doesn't exist. Exist, but the question still remains: Where did it come from? Where? Right. where I mean, where, how? Where, why did this suddenly appear in 1995 in Puerto Rico, of all places? And uh, you know, being cited for the very first time in August '95 by this woman, Madeline Tolentino, and so that was sort of the big mystery. That was a huge question mark that that I I hadn't been able to answer. Um, and finally, I, I I went back and I looked at all the influences that happened right around that time. Like why why would some creature that looked like that again we're talking a bipedal spiky backed alien eyed weird creature why would that suddenly appear in in august 95 and uh what i discovered was that there was actually um you know there there was no animals that look like that i mean there there simply are none I've, right i've there's there it does not look like a bear it doesn't look like an elk there there are no known animals that look anything like that there is however a, uh, a fictional movie creature that looks almost exactly like that. And that is the creature Sill in the movie Species. 
Um, and uh, it's, it was a you know, big science fiction uh, horror thriller film. Mm-hmm. And uh, it starred uh, Ben Kingsley and Natasha Henstridge and, and uh, Michael Madsen, as I recall, and a couple others. And uh, it was a huge hit and spawned several sequels. Uh, but the original was, uh, it was about this, um, it was about this, uh, the, the, these, uh, this group of scientists that sent out uh, signals into space and they got an answer back uh, telling them how to combine human DNA with alien DNA. And the result is, well, in its human form, it's a tall, blonde, nude <laughs> Canadian uh, supermodel, which is quite nice. Nice, I have to say. Uh, however, in its other form, it looks like uh, it looks like the chupacabra. It looks like what Madeline Tolentino described as the chupacabra. And once I realized this, I'm like, oh my god, this is you know the similarities are very. I mean, I, I go into I go into it in, in the chapter in my book. There's much more detail there. But when I when I when I compare them. You know, they're both bipedal. They both they both have these distinctive spikes down the back. They have these alien type wraparound eyes. Uh, there's all these things that make them uh, very very similar. Um, and in the the it gets even more interesting when you when you know the story of the of species, uh, which is what is the origin story of the creature sill, and the origin story of the creature sill, which is identical to the chupacabra, which is that uh, sill uh, the alien monster uh, uh, of the movie is both a extraterrestrial al- space alien creature and it's also by amazing coincidence it's also the result of top secret go- you know US government genetic experiments gone wrong i mean the the origin stories are identical uh, and that that just blew my mind when I when I put those together. I'm like, wow, this 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 helps explain why people think the chupacabra th- came from this is because this is this came from a movie, right? Uh, and so w- once I started piecing together, I'm like, wow. So so th- at that point, then the question was. Oh, and by the way, I should add that um, the, the 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 creature sill uh, it was designed by H.R. Giger, uh, who uh, who died a couple years back. But he's best known for doing um, these for weird gothic uh, pieces of art, and he's also he also won an Academy Award for the creature design in the movie Alien. So that's the the creature design, the, the alien creature with all the teeth and the jaws. That was H.R. Giger's uh, creation, oh, and he okay. also. And he also designed uh, the, the the creature sill, which is why it looks like that. Um, so so once once I sort of started piecing all this together, and I actually interviewed uh, a guy who had worked on the movie Species, and I interviewed him and talked to him about the creature design. It was really interesting. Um, but then the question was, okay, well, when did it come out? Well, the answer is that the movie Species came out in August of 1995, and hmm. so I'm thinking. You know, is it possible that the very first person to ever see the, the chupacabra got confused by something that she saw in a movie? And uh, so uh, I, I, you know, I, I was like, well, it, it's it's certainly the, all the pieces would fit, but I wasn't sure. And however, I ended up uh, looking in a uh, in a book by Scott Corrales called Chupacabra and Other Mysteries. Not a good book. I don't recommend it. <laughs> it is <laughs> well, with all due respect to Scott, it's 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 not a great book. But um, but it it was actually useful. Because because it contained an interview with Madeline Tolentino, the woman that first saw the, the Chupacabra. And in that interview, in, printed in this book, which came out long before I had my theory, it says, I saw the movie Species, and the creature in there looked a lot like the Chupacabra. This is her own quote. I'm, I'm not making this up, not putting words in her mouth. This is what she told another interviewer in 1996. Uh, so this was pretty much a smoking gun in, in my opinion. I said, well, hold on. We, we know for a fact that she saw the movie. Not only did she see the movie, she, she herself said <laughs> the creature in this movie looks a lot like the Chupacabra that she later reported and so on and so on. Um, so at that point, that sort of crystallized in my mind, the, the final piece of the puzzle. Because I'd, I'd really addressed all the other aspects of the, the Chupacabra mystery, and I can talk about those more if you want. But the, the final piece of the puzzle, to me, was saying, why in the world did this weird alien-type spiky back Chupacabra thing appear in August 95? And that's because 
The answer is because that's when a movie came out <laughs> right around that time, uh, about a week or two earlier, that this woman saw. And uh, that, I, I believe, is the answer. And I, I, I flew down to Puerto Rico, interviewed her, uh, and she was an interesting, nice woman. And, um, you know, I, I met her and it was, uh, had a great interview. And I saw the original place where she saw the Chupacabra and all this. And, you know, one of the questions that, that I'm asked is, well, you know, what about that report? And, you know, look, I don't know. I, I, you know, I don't think she's a liar. I don't think she's a hoaxer. Uh, she seemed very sincere. She was very nice. Uh, I, I think that she just got confused. I think that she, she just simply misremembered, uh, what she saw in a movie and, and thought that it, it happened to her in real life. And that doesn't mean she's crazy. It doesn't mean it's, it's, it's called confabulation and it's a psychological process. And it's, it's the way in which people, People's memories get confused, and sometimes they'll they'll remember something is happening in their own lives when they actually saw it on a movie or in a TV show. (laughs) And it doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen, and it happens more often than we realize. And so once I sort of brought that into it, I was like, you know, I think all these pieces fit, and I think that that's the uh, that's the ultimate answer in terms of where the chupacabra came from. Okay. Now, folks, uh, we're going to take a quick break here. You're listening to Paratruth Radio. We're going to hear Justin's Paranormal Headlines. And now, Paratruth Radio's Paranormal Headlines. Hey, Parafans. Justin here with your Paranormal Headlines. These headlines are from unexplainedmysteries.com. Cat with alien eyes becomes internet star. A cat called Matilda has been raising eyebrows online due to her extremely unusual appearance. While at first glance it might appear as though photographs of the unusual looking feline have been subjected to a fair amount of digital tampering in Photoshop. The truth of the matter is that Matilda really does sport a pair of enormous black eyes that make her look a little bit like an extraterrestrial. Her peculiar appearance is due to a rare condition known as lens luxation, which has unfortunately left her unable to see. However, she is not in any discomfort and still lives life to the full. The fearless feline has even become something of an internet celebrity after pictures of her appeared online, and she now has her own website. I am a visitor here, her tongue-in-cheek Instagram account states. Pay attention to me. Have you seen anyone else that looks like this? I'm seeking my kind. Cryobot could tunnel beneath Europa's ice. Scientists are developing a robot designed to explore the ocean beneath Jupiter's icy moon. With NASA planning to send a spacecraft to Europa in the not-so-distant future, efforts have been underway to design a probe capable of venturing down into the liquid water ocean below its surface. Getting a probe down beneath the ice is certainly no easy task. Not only would it have to land on Europa first, but it would then need to somehow burrow down through several miles of thick ice and remain operational once it hits the water. One major challenge is how such a probe would be able to communicate to the surface once it starts to descend, said planetary scientist Louise Proctor. The cryobot would also need to be able to withstand significant pressures underneath the ice. We're still a long way from having the technology to do that. Nonetheless, explorer and engineer Bill Stone, founder of robot design company Stone Aerospace, believes that he has come up with a device that could actually make such a mission possible. Known as Valkyrie, very deep, autonomous, laser-powered, kilowatt-class, yo-yoing, robotic ice explorer. The sophisticated cryobot uses the heat from lasers to make its way down through the ice, while a fiber optic cable connected to the device maintains power and communications. While the current 5 kilowatt version is a lot smaller than what would be needed in an actual mission to Europa, the concept has been successfully tested and does appear to work. We've been doing a 5 kilowatt test only because of budget limitations, said Stone. I can build today a 250 kilowatt laser powered cryobot. It would cost more money, but we could illustrate it in Antarctica and show that we can go through 
kilometers of ice. And this has been Justin with your Paranormal Headlines. This was a segment of Parachute Radio's Paranormal Headlines. All right, folks, welcome back to Paratruth Radio. My name is Eric. And I'm Justin. And we are speaking with Benjamin Radford, who wrote the book Tracking the Chupacabra. Now, Ben, just moments ago, we were discussing about how uh, you, you kind of found this key between the original sighting of the Chupacabra and the movie Species. Mm-hmm. So now the big question, I guess, comes down to this. Is the Chupacabra real in the sense that there's actually a blood-sucking creature out there? Or is it just 100% made up? Well, um, <laughs> I'm going to throw in some nuance here. Um, okay. You know, I, I when I was researching the, the, the book and doing and doing the, all the work and writing on it, I didn't assume that it was a real creature, but I didn't assume it wasn't. Uh, you know, when I do my investigations, and I've done investigations for 15, 16 years now into, you know, Bigfoot, lake monsters, ghosts, crop circles, you know, take your pick. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's important to me as an investigator to not go in as a debunker. I don't begin an investigation saying, well, this is all bullshit. There's no way this is real. This is it's ridiculous. There's no way. So, you know, I tried to keep an open mind and say, okay, well, you know, I had to treat the chupacabra as real until until I could pretty well prove that it wasn't. And that's why I did a, a chapter on on vampirism. You know, like, what about the, the dead animals? Because people report, you know, seeing dead chickens and goats and things like that. And the question is, okay, well, if a chupacabra didn't attack those, then what did? Mm-hmm. And I researched that, and I talked to, I interviewed medical examiners and forensics people, and I explained that and all this. And so... Basically, by the time that I, I finished the book, I had to conclude that the chupacabra almost certainly does not exist. The chupacabra, as popularly conceived, you know, this mm-hmm. vampiric, you know, sort of chameleon type you know, creature, it, it just there's just no good evidence. Uh, there's no uh, there's no photographs. There's no footprints. There's no bodies, alive or dead. I mean, there there's so little actual tangible evidence for the chupacabra. Other than again, you have these these uh, these essentially you know uh, hairless dead canids, uh, which again when you do the DNA testing, they turn out to be dogs, coyotes, foxes, things like that. Right, right. Uh, and so I mean, so those clearly can't be the chupacabra uh, for a variety of reasons, including they don't have they don't have the the, the actual structures, the the mouth structures and and the the intestine structures that you would need to suck blood. So I I, I really you know, I tried to be very very thorough about it. And so my my ultimate conclusion was that the chupacabra, as conceived as this sort of vampiric creature thing, it it, it almost certainly doesn't exist. It can't exist. There's there, there would ha- there's just such a, a lack of evidence out there. <laughs> but but so you know in my book I, I you know I I the way I see it is that um, you know. I see my research on the chupacabra. It's it's not really about the creature it, it itself. It's about how how an idea can circulate uh, among cultures and in, in society, where somebody can see something in a movie and mistake it for real life and tell somebody else, and then it goes on the radio, and then you know then you have other people get a hold of it and they, they put their own spin on the story next thing you know it's online next thing you know it's on a, a, a you know a spanish language tv show and then and then it gets you know it essentially snowballs and then so at that point you know here we are you know 20 some years later you, you know you have you, you have all these different parts of the puzzle and so to my mind you know the conclusion that i came up with was that my research it's not so much about a living, breathing, tangible creature that that almost certainly doesn't exist. It's about it's about folklore made real. It's about why people you know, can perceive things and misunderstand things and interpret them as something unusual, paranormal. Mm-hmm. So that's that's sort of where I come from. It. So I think the last question that I personally have in regards to 
I guess what evidence people would use to support the chupacabra say the bodies or the animals that they found uh, that supposedly had the blood drained out of them. Have you come across those stories? And A, are they true? And if they are, do, would you throw this off as some kind of a cult practice? Maybe, I don't know, some, some kind of a cult practice or maybe some kind of short Satan worship or something or just some kids goofing off trying to you know, make this chupacabra thing more real than it really is? Or did you just not come up with anything in regards to why these animals are being found drained? Well, there, there's a couple questions, and it's sort of a complex answer. I'll try to I'll try not okay. to ramp on about, it, but it is it's a complex answer. The there's a couple answers. One of them is that what you find is that the the claims that you often find on TV shows, which are among the worst, <laughs> I, yeah. I, you know, as as someone who wrote a book on this, and frankly, I'm not bragging, but I am the guy that you know researches this more than anybody else. I see these TV shows and like throwing stuff at the camera, at the TV. I'm like no you got that wrong i'm just screaming at tv i just need to <laughs> just take a deep breath get a drink it's okay you know whatever but you know one of the things is that one of the, the one of the most common claims is that i see and i see this all the time like you know a farmer came upon this and he found you know 800 pigs all drained of blood every drop of blood was gone it's like well really are you are you sure about that? Who, who checked that? Do we did he guess that they were gone? I mean, so and what you find is that in, in every case that I looked at, when you had these these sensational claims like you know, and I again I see him over and you know dozens of chickens without a drop of blood, mm-hmm. and like well how do you know that? Did did someone cut them all open? Were these autopsied? I mean, who how? Why do you say that? And the answer is always, well, they just, they didn't seem to have any blood in it, or I didn't think about it, or I assumed, you know, it's like, and so over and over my book, that's one of the things I try to clear up is that just because somebody says, just because some news report says that they, all these animals mysteriously drained without a drop of blood doesn't mean it's true. In fact, most of the cases I looked into, it wasn't true. The animals did, in fact, have blood in them. Um, and, in fact, uh, I, there's, a, there's a Puerto Rican veterinarian I quote in the book who talks about exactly that. He says, look, you know, I'm here in Puerto Rico. People, every now and then people bring us animals that they think have been attacked by chupacabra. When we autopsy them, there's blood in them. It's right there. I mean, they're they're not oozing blood, but what happens is, and again, this goes back to forensics and medical examination. But what happens mm-hmm. to an animal is, if it gets if it dies, uh, with just puncture marks, for example, if it's bitten on the neck, uh, it's not going to bleed out. Uh, what happens is the the heart stops and the blood pressure drops because you know the, the heart stop, and so the blood settles in the body, and so what you you have the blood pools on the bottom part of the body, and so if you just poke at it, if you, even if you cut it cut it open like on the top where you would, you're not going to see blood because it's it's not in that part of the body, it's it's sunk down to the bottom, and it's coagulated, and so there's this illusion of of vampirism. There's this illusion these things have been actually drained blood when in fact they haven't. And again, I, I have a section in the book I talk about the illusion of vampirism and how, how it can appear to, to people um, that, that these things don't have blood in them when in fact they do. And the other mm-hmm. thing to keep in mind is that, is that almost invariably the people that are making this claim are farmhands. They're some guy that came across it. These are not veterinarians. These were not medical pathologists. These aren't people who actually have any medical training. And so that doesn't mean they're stupid. It's just that the average person doesn't have the, the medical and forensic knowledge to determine blood loss. They just don't. Right. Uh, and so that's that's so that's that's part of the answer is that in many of the cases where people claim, ooh, this is mysterious. In fact, it's not mysterious at all. Uh, there actually is blood in it. They just didn't find it or, or they actually didn't have anybody who is qualified to examine it, look at it. And, and so that's, I mean, that, that's essentially the, the answer to it. Um, and it's, it's people who, again, they're people who are filling in their gaps of knowledge with, with folklore, with superstition, with rumors and gossip. And again, it, it's, it's normal. It's human. <laughs> that's what we do, right? Right. We, we don't know something. We don't know what's, what's happening, you know, in some facility. So we assume it's, you know, it's the worst. It's, you know, experiments or it's conspiracy, whatever else. People normally naturally fill in these these sensational details uh, mm-hmm. when they don't have the facts, and that's that's very much what happens with the uh, with the supposed blood drainage. All right, Ben, we're coming real close to the end of the show, so I did want to give you a chance to tell everybody where they can find you, find your book, all that good stuff again. 
Sure. Um, well, uh, again, my name is Benjamin Radford, B-E-N-J-A-M-I-N-R-A-D-F-O-R-D. You can find me at BenjaminRadford.com. Uh, you can also find me um, on, uh, uh, let's see, at uh, Discovery News. I do stuff there. I'm also on TV on occasion uh, when they can drag me out of the office to go do stuff. <laughs> uh, I've, uh, again, I've written um, s- uh, seven or eight books. Uh, my last book was called Mysterious New Mexico, and it's a collection of about a dozen investigations here in New Mexico on ghosts and monsters and uh, miracles and weird things like that. And coming out next year, I have a book on bad clowns, scary and evil clowns coming out next year. So look for that. Well, thank you so much for coming on tonight. And it's been really eye-opening and very entertaining on top of that. So uh, thank you so much for coming Mm -hmm. on. And maybe once that new book comes out, we'll have you on again. Definitely. Sounds like fun. Thanks for having me on. Good to talk to you guys. You too. Have a good night, Ben. See you. All right, folks. That was Ben Radford, author of Tracking the Chupacabra. And such an amazing guest. He definitely had a lot of information. I do encourage you guys to check this book out. It's one of the better books I've seen written about a cryptid because it not just breaks down the different theories he gives his own personal views on on what he thinks these things can be as well mm-hmm. completely agree and now the big question i actually have a big question for you justin okay because uh this is a topic the chupacabra we actually did the chupacabra quite a couple like a couple a few months few months ago actually it's been about yeah. three or four months it's been a while you know back when we did the chupacabra thing the chupa 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 copper thing. Gotta, <laughs> yeah, that that's got to get that right. The train. For those of you who didn't know what that was, it's the chupa 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 copper train, <laughs> which uh, we always love jumping on and taking a ride through the woods with. Yeah. Um, but you know, this is one topic that I think you and about, you and I have always questioned: Is it real? Yeah. Now, Bigfoot, obviously, there's not a lot of evidence, and even the evidence that we do have isn't very significant. People still claim it's real, 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 real. Here's someone, Benjamin, who comes right out and says that after all of his research, he can say that it does not exist. Where does that put you right now, you know, in your mind as to, you know, what, I guess, in regards to this particular cryptid, like your original thoughts compared before the show compared to now, I guess? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, just like all these other cryptids, you don't have evidence to prove it. And I never truly believed in the Chupacabra just as much as I don't completely believe in the Bigfoot either. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing that we've always said is I, I feel that fear plays a huge factor in a lot of these cryptid uh, confrontations. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the other ones that we've brought up numerous times as well is possibly demonic affliction or oppression or even mental illness. Mm-hmm. So I, I honestly, I think that that sways me towards the this thing doesn't exist. Right. I completely agree with you. And honestly, having a book and having someone to come forward and present the evidence uh, and have the proof thereof uh, to tell us that this creature most likely does not exist. It's actually, it's actually kind of warming to hear something like that because everything out there these days, you know, exists somewhere, you know, it's hiding and we just haven't found it yet. Uh, And that goes along with the whole Bigfoot thing and this and that. So it's kind of nice to hear someone come out and say, no, it doesn't exist and have proof for that. Now, whether or not that is 100%, of course, it's always up in the air. Not everyone's going to believe our radio show right? or the people we have on or what we say. But, hey, this is just another, I guess, something to add to all your research. You know, when you're doing research, folks, regardless of what it is, whether it's cryptid research, spiritual research, you name it, you always have to look at things from two sides. If you're looking to just prove that it exists then any evidence you find that proves it doesn't, you're going to throw out. And you're going to keep, you know, no, this is real, this is real. And you can't do that. Because all it does is lead you astray and got you believing in something that really probably, possibly doesn't exist. Uh, and so I think he has to... Yeah. <laughs> you know? In other words, 
look for the truth. Mm-hmm. The truth is out there. Agent Agent Mulder's been looking for a long time. Yeah, and uh, we know a show. The show's coming back, so obviously he hasn't found it quite yet. Right. <laughs> so and it's been gone for a while. Yeah. Um, but in regards to this, we all know what time it is. It's scripture time. We did it. We did it. We did it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> okay. So. I have two sides to this regarding scripture. All right. The very first one, actually a lot of it is in regards to what we talked about last week, the whole conspiracy theory thing, being careful of what you get into, what you talk about, what you share, so on and so right. forth. Right. This kind of adds on to that a little bit. Uh, Proverbs 18, eight says the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost parts. That same verse in the NAS version says the words of a tail bearer are like tasty trifles. And what this is basically telling us is that when we gossip, when we come up with an idea or hear an idea and we decide to spread it without knowing the truth, people are going to accept it regardless. Whether it's true or not, people are going to accept it. And that's just the thing. You know, the the word tail bearer, tail typically means it's not true, you know? Right. And so... You have to be careful. You have to be really careful. If you're going to spread information uh, around the world, you know, to all your friends and your family, and we all know how quickly that spreads from there, especially with Facebook these days. Uh, Just the Internet in general. Yeah, the Internet in general. You know, lies are out there. Lies are out there. And they're, those lies are going to pull you away from the truth. That's what lies are. That's what they do. They keep the truth away. Absolutely. Uh, But on the other hand, I am going to take another different approach to this. Genesis chapter 1, verse 24. We could actually go to 22. I'm going to go with, uh, I mean, 20 as well, not 22. But we're going to go to verse 24, Genesis 1, 24. It says, and God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. Very interesting. Something very interesting. God does not mention the names or types of all of these animals. Does the same thing in the uh, book of Genesis when we're talking about Noah. Right. You know, he says he brings two of every kind of animal to the boat, but he doesn't specify exactly what animals those are. Right. How many of us, if we didn't have evidence of dinosaurs existing, would truly believe dinosaurs existed? You know? Right. So, I mean, when you think about it, you, these giant lizard-like creatures that would destroy houses and tear everything apart, when, when you don't have bones or fossils or evidence to prove their existence, it just seems like some crazy, you know, imaginative, imaginative thing. So, you know, you really got to just keep that in mind is like, it's almost very difficult to talk because I just want to listen to the song. (laughs) It's beautiful. Seeing as you just saw the movie, I'm sure. (laughs) I did. But I I actually hummed this song a lot over the years. Yeah. Uh, All the way up until yesterday, and now I'm humming it even more. (laughs) Again. So the Bible tells us that you know, you know, there is no, it doesn't specify what type of animals God created. And because it doesn't specify, for all we know, there could be a number of different creatures that we have yet to find, whether still in existence or extinct. Right. You know, we just don't know. So could God have created something like the Chupacabra at one point? Sure. Absolutely he could have. Could he have created something like the Bigfoot? Of course. The Loch Ness Monster? We've already been through this. That is a dinosaur. Right. A plesiosaur. So, yes, the answer is absolutely yes for that one. But, but it we, even, they even talk about sea monsters in the Bible. So, they, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and so to, to come right out and say, hey, this cryptid, this cryptid, this cryptid does not exist 100 percent. Could be a lie on our, be, on our behalf saying, you know what? No, because there's no possible way God would have created something like this. But then that puts a restriction on his creativity and his ability to create things. Very true. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not Adam and I'm not Eve. I don't want to be. Where there are our ancestors, they might know exactly what God created in the beginning, 
They probably walked with dinosaurs at one time. In fact, the Bible even tells us at, at some point in, in regards to the way God talks about the uh, uh, the behemoth, for example. Many people believe, not just Christians, but you know, whether you're in the, a Christian or a non-Christian, many people believe that the behemoth could represent a long neck dinosaur of some sort, or a brachiosaur, uh, just by the way its description is. So, you know, who, who knows what God created? I really don't know, but I, I know we just got to be careful in the end of what exactly what rumors it is that we spread. You know, well, and that's the thing too. Like, yeah, God could have created this thing, or as Ben was saying through the the creationist uh, cre- creationalist viewpoint, maybe this is something of the devil. You know, we don't know. We're just coming by what evidence is presented to us, and in the long run, really, does our opinion matter to anybody? I hope so, but you guys need right. to come to your own conclusions. Right. Absolutely. And that's the only way uh, this world keeps on spinning. Yeah. You start, you, you know, God created us with a free will for a reason, to make your own decisions. Some of those decisions are just simple decisions that won't affect life one way or the other. Other decisions will affect life dramatically. But in this particular instance regarding cryptids, it's not that big of a deal. If you believe in a cryptid, I person- personally say, believe in the cryptid. Just don't let it consume your life. That's the that's where the issue comes in. And do the research. Do the research. Definitely do the research. Know what you're researching. Know what this creature is. And you know what? If you find it doesn't exist, accept it. Right. <sighs> All right. I think that's all we got for you guys tonight. So it's time to say goodbye. (laughs) I'm going to miss you guys. (laughs) We will be back next week. Same time, same channel with special guest Ken Gearhart. And uh, it's going to be as an amazing of an episode as today was, if not more so, because we're just going to keep bringing it to you guys. So Mm -hmm. uh, on that note, my name's Justin. Wait oh, oh crap. Did I forget something? You forgot something. Whoa. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's amazing. No, I'm not going to go there. Never mind. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go there. Anyway, <laughs> at the beginning of the show, you and I talked. One thing that we mentioned at the beginning was Scarefest. And we wanted to make sure we shared that twice tonight at the beginning of the show and at the end. Folks, ladies, gentlemen, children, which, by the way, if there are children listening, I hope your parents are around because things can get creepy on the show at times. Um, Other than, again, kids these days. Right. (laughs) Look the devil in the face and laugh, which is not a good thing, kids. Right. That's a bad road to walk down. Anyway. So, folks, Scarefest. Scarefest 8. Scarefest 8, 2015. It is coming this September, September 11th to the September 13th. And yours truly, as well as my co-host, Justine, are going to be there all three days. All and part three of Thursday. Days. Part, yeah. of, part of Thursday probably as well. So almost four days if you get there early. Um, but yeah, we are going to be wearing our brand new Paratruth Radio t-shirts with a brand new design on them. Logo design, same thing. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, folks, if you're going to be at Scarefest, first and foremost, let us know. Email us. Tell us, hey, we're going to be there. We want to see you because we'll be walking around. And when you see our Paratruth Radio t-shirts, come up and say hello because we'd like to talk to you. We want to meet you. We want to just hang out and have fun. So definitely, you know, come by. That's all I got on that right there. Before we close out completely, I just want to put this out there, folks. The past couple of weeks, we've opened up our email to everyone to say, if you have any questions, if you have any ideas for shows or guests that you'd like us to have on the show, feel free to email us. Also, in regards to this show tonight, I know not everyone agrees with Benjamin that the Chupacabra doesn't exist. I know a lot of people don't believe, don't agree with us on anything that we say. So if you have some reason to believe that something, you know, is false regarding what we say or true, feel free to comment. 
We want those comments. You can either comment to us through email at paratruthradio at gmail.com. Or, of course, there's also a comment box on paratruthradio.com. And there's a comment box, kind of a comment box, (laughs) at spreaker.com. So definitely, you know, let us know your thoughts. We want to hear all the thoughts and opinions. We want to interact with everybody. We want to make this personal. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and the final thing that I do have to say, check out BenjaminRadford.com. Check out all of his information. Even get the book. It's an amazing book. It's an amazing read. I actually had a really easy time reading through it. So on that... That's saying a lot. (laughs) Yeah. It's very hard sometimes for me to sit down and read. So um, (laughs) on that note, I'm Justin. And I'm Eric. And we will talk to you guys next week. Same time, same channel. Peace. If you enjoyed this episode of Parachute Radio and you would like to listen to it again or are interested in listening to any of our past episodes, then you can listen to them on HD at our website, parachutheradio.com. And you can also find us at Stitcher, Blueberry, TuneIn, iTunes, Spreaker, and YouTube. And of course, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter for brand new updates of our show every day.